Okay, hello, this is Peter Harper. Welcome to this talk on analog low power circuits. So let me start with a brief motivation. Why do we need low power analog circuit? So as you know, circuits and also analog circuits are used more and more, for example, in Internet of Things applications. And when you need so many circuits for these applications, it becomes more and more important that the size and the power consumption is constrained. And that's one of the reasons why we need ultra low power circuits. The question now is though, how do we reach that and what are especially uh, the challenges that we face when we try to go there. And rather than going to show you some circuit examples, I would like to go to the basics and discuss with you the basic components, transistors, resistors, and capacitors, because if you know how to scale these to go to ultra low power, then you also know how to build your circuits. So let me first start with transistors. So traditionally transistors, for example, in amplifiers are biased in a strong inversion mode and saturation. And this means that you put the gate source voltage above the threshold and then you get the known relations of the current and the transconductance. However, for low power design, people prefer to bias the transistors in a weak inversion mode, where the gate source voltage is below the threshold voltage. There are several advantages of doing that. Uh, the first one is that you can use lower voltages for the gate source and drain source voltages, which means you can operate from a lower supply and because of that you save power. A second advantage is that the transconductance or GM of a transistor in weak inversion is higher as compared to strong inversion if you assume that you use the same bias in current ID. This is what you can see in the graph below. As a result, it means that the power efficiency of circuits in weak inversion is improved. Is it only good news? Well, not really, because remember, uh, the drain source current in weak inversion is exponentially related to the voltages and the temperature. And because of that, um, the transistors here are very sensitive to process, voltage, and temperature variations. And over here in this slide, you see a simulation of a transistor, a PMOS transistor with a gate source voltage equal to zero. And we simulate what happens with the current if you sweep the temperature. What you can see here is that uh, the current will change with about a factor 1000 over this range. And of course, it's very hard to make a reliable circuit if your current, and because of that, your other parameters, are shifting so much over the temperature range. So this is one of the reasons why you have to be careful in the weak inversion mode. A strong advice here is to, to make sure that you bias your critical transistors with current rather than with the voltages, because in that way you avoid this large variation over temperature and process variation, and you have a better definition of your transconductant and your noise, for instance. Another part of transistors to discuss is about leakage. Especially in modern technologies, there's quite a bit of leakage in transistors, which can be either from the drain to the source or into the gate. Now, if you design a circuit for a high, very high power consumption target, this often doesn't matter so much because your intended current is anyway much higher than the leakage. However, if you go to very low power consumption numbers, you'll start to see that the leakage becomes important or even dominates the total power. And because of that, the performance of the circuit may not be what you expected it to be. A solution to that is using, for example, duty cycling techniques. So in the lower graph, you see with the, with the green dashed line, for instance, what happens with a continuous time, always on circuit, designed for low power. You see that the current consumption is similar to the leakage, and because of that, the performance may not be reliable. As an alternative, you can use duty cycling, which is shown by the green solid line. You see here the circuit is on only for short moments in time, at those moments, you use a very high current consumption. But the average power consumption and the performance that you can attain is similar to the always on circuit. There are two main advantages. The first one is that during the on phases, the active current is very high, much higher than the leakage. So you get your performance reliably back again. And the second advantage is that during the sleep time, the off mode, you can optimize your circuit to have a very low leakage. And in that way, you reduce the losses. Now let's move to resistors. If you design low power and low current circuits, it usually implies that you need to make resistors which have a very high impedance in the order of giga ohms. If you do this with normal resistors like diffusion or polysilicon resistors, this will take a large chip area. You can see this in the example figure here where you scale a circuit from microampere to nanoampere range. And you see the circuit maybe doesn't change much, but the resistors become much larger and take really a very large area. So to avoid that, there are a few solutions used. The first one is using pseudo-resistors. Here you use PMOS devices 
in the subthreshold region which are used as a resistor. Because these transistors are almost off, there is only a very minor conductivity of the channel, and this means you can make a very high impedance resistance with a very small transistor. It also has some disadvantages. First of all, these resistors are highly nonlinear. And secondly, as we saw before, it suffers from PVT variations, which can change your impedance, for example, with a factor 100 over, over the corners. And this, again, makes it very hard to make a predictable circuit. So what you can do about this is you can, for example, make the gate source voltage tunable. And if you tune this, then you can compensate for the variation of impedance. If you do it in a smart way, you can do this on-chip, for instance, as this example is showing. Um, where you have on-chip biasing network or on-chip feedback to stabilize the impedance over the different variations. If you don't want to go to pseudo resistors, an alternative is, for instance, to use a switch capacitor or a switched resistor network. What you do here is you have a capacitor or a resistor, you add a few switches, which are controlled by a certain clock frequency or a certain duty cycle, and by doing that you can get a certain gain factor on top of your original impedance. And in this way, with small passives and a few switches, you can make also a high impedance effective resistance. The nice thing is that you only need clock signals here and basic uh, regular passive components. And because of that, the performance is more predictable as compared to the pseudo resistors. So last but not least, something about cap capacitors. Also here, we need high impedances like the resistors because of the small currents. But fortunately for a capacitor, a high impedance means that we need a small value capacitance. For example, we go down from picofarads all the way down to attofarads these days. So this is nice because it really makes the design very small. The challenge now, however, however is how to make such small capacitors in the first place, and what about the mismatch of these capacitors, because that is often critical in applications like data converters. So making small capacitors is fortunately something you can do yourself by drawing the layout and as shown in this graph, you can, for example, draw very small metal strips which implement your capacitance. In terms of matching, there are also techniques that you can apply. So in this example, we see three capacitors which are binary scaled for a binary scaled ADC by changing the length of the devices. However, you might know if you just scale the length of these metal structures here, the scaling of the capacitors won't be accurate. Uh, because there are all kinds of edge and end effects or because of the vias of these um, metal strips. So you have to compensate that. And that's why in this graph you see there are compensation capacitors added, which are on a schematic level subtracted from the main capacitors. And in that way you compensate all the edge and end effects and you can get good matching of these capacitors. And at the same time you see you can achieve very small values in the out of average range. So that discussed the components, and with that you can now build your circuits. Just for illustration, I'm showing you here a few examples of circuits that apply the techniques that I just described. And you see that things like amplifiers, ADCs, voltage and current references, and also sensor interfaces all can use these techniques. And by doing that, they can achieve power consumptions nowadays, which are in the orders of nanowatts, or they can achieve a very small silicon area. If you want to know more about these techniques or dig into these circuits, then please have a look uh, to these references. Last but not least, I would also like to point out a few relevant papers here at the ESTRAC 2018 conferences. Analog circuits are almost everywhere, that's very good news. But if you're particularly interested in low power circuits, you can, for instance, have a look at the sessions which are mentioned on this slide. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for watching, and I hope you liked it.